of them born between 1980 and 1995, and they're rapidly taking over from the baby boomers who are now pushing 60. They were raised by doting parents who told them they were special, played in little leagues with no winners or losers or all winners. They're laden with trophies just for participating, and they think your business-as-usual ethic is for the birds. And if you persist in the belief, you can take your job and shove it. Corporate America is so unnerved by all this that companies like Merrill Lynch, Ernst & Young, and Disney and scores of others are hiring consultants to teach them how to deal with this generation that only takes yes for an answer. The workplace has become a psychological battlefield and the millennials have the upper hand. They are tech savvy, every gadget imaginable, almost an extension of their bodies. They multitask, talk, walk, listen, and type and text, and their priorities are simple. They come first. Just ask Marion Saltzman, an ad agency executive at J. Walter Thompson, who's been managing and tracking millennials since they entered the workforce. Some of them are the greatest generation. They're more hardworking. They have these tools to get things done. They're enormously clever and resourceful. Some of the others are absolutely incorrigible. Mm -hmm. um, it's their way or the highway. Um, the rest of us are old, redundant, should be retired. How dare we come in? Anyone over 30 not only can't be trusted, can't be counted upon to be sort of coherent. Saltzman says today's manager must be half shrink and half diplomat. Just take me through some of the do's and don'ts in how you must speak to this generation of young workers. You do have to speak to them a little bit like a therapist on television might speak to a patient. <laughs> you can't be harsh. You cannot tell them you're disappointed in them. You can't really ask them to live and breathe a company because they're living and breathing themselves and that keeps them very busy. Faced with new employees who want to roll into work with their iPods and flip-flops around noon but still be CEO by Friday, companies are realizing that the era of the button-down exec Happy to have a job is as dead as the three martini lunch. These young people tell you what time their yoga class is, and the day's work will be organized around the fact that they have this commitment. So you actually envy them. How wonderful it is to be young and have your priorities so clear. The flip side of it is how awful it is to be managing the extension sort of of the teenage babysitting pool. You better make sure... All of which has led, as you'd expect, to a whole new industry or epidemic of consultants, experts, they allege, in how to motivate, train, and, yes, sometimes nanny the extraterrestrials who've taken over the workplace. Mary Crane, who once whipped up souffles for the White House, now offers crash courses for millennials in, well, the obvious. As to the tattoos, just make sure they stay covered up within the office. Again, especially if you're going to be meeting clients. It's a perfect storm that we've created to put these people in a position where they suddenly have to perform as professionals and haven't been trained. Basic training, this like so how to eat with a knife and fork, or indeed how to work. Today, fewer and fewer middle class kids hold summer jobs because mowing lawns does not get you into harbor. They have climbed Mount Everest. They've been down to Machu Picchu to help excavate it, but they've never punched a time clock. They have no idea what it's like to actually be in an office at 9 o'clock with people handing them work and, oh, by the way, possibly asking them to stay late in the evening or their weekends. Crane maintains that while this generation has extraordinary technical skills, childhoods filled with trophies and adulation didn't prepare them for the cold realities of work. You now have a generation coming into the workplace that has grown up with the expectation that they will automatically win and they'll always be rewarded, even for just showing up. To what extent are you having to tell the boomers, the bosses, the 50 to 60 year olds, the people who've got to change are you guys, not and them? The boomers do need to hear the message that they're going to have to start focusing more on coaching rather than bossing. If this generation in particular, you just tell them, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this, they truly will walk. And every major law firm, every major company knows this is the future. The future of sweet-talking bosses. No more pay your dues just like I did. If this generation knows anything, it's that there are more jobs than young people to fill them. I believe that they actually think of themselves like merchandise on eBay. <laughs> if you don't want me, Mr. Employer, I'll go sell myself down the street. I'll probably get more money. 
I'll definitely get a better experience. And by the way, they'll adore me. You only like me. So who's to blame for the narcissistic praise hounds now taking over the office? Wall Street Journal columnist Jeffrey Zaslow covers trends in the workplace and points the finger at the man who was once America's favorite next door neighbor. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. He had a guy like Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers on the TV, and he was telling his preschoolers, you're special, you're special, and he meant well, but we as parents ran with it, and we said, you know, are, you're you, Junior, you're special, and you're special, and you're special, and for, for doing what? We didn't really explain that. But isn't this generation, particularly middle-class kids, really quite special? Aren't they, in some ways, much better than your generation, certainly mine? Well, except when we were younger, you had a piano teacher who expected you to practice your piano and work hard at it, and the parents expected it. And now parents say, have fun, learn the piano, practice a little bit. So there's not the expectations that they will achieve and work hard. It's just it's not the same work ethic. Zaslow says that the coddling virus continues to eat away even when Junior goes off to college. I heard from several professors who said, a student will come up after class and say, um, I don't like my grade, and my mom wants to talk to you. Here's the phone. And the students think it's like a service. I deserve an A because I'm paying for it. What are you giving me a C for? Today, more than half of college seniors move home after graduation. It's a safety net or safety diaper that allows many kids to quickly opt out of a job they don't like. There once was, if not shame, a little certain uneasiness about Good. being seen to be living at home in your mid-twenties. Not only is there no shame with it, but this is thought to be a very smart, wise economic decision. Well, that would suggest that they probably had pretty happy childhoods. Who couldn't be happy when you're growing up in a world where there's no failure? And dear old mom isn't just your landlord, she's your agent as well. Career services departments are complaining about the parents who are coming to update their child's resume. And in fact, you go to employers and they're starting to express concern now with the parents who will phone HR saying, but my little Susie or little Johnny didn't get the performance evaluation that I think they deserve. Our parents really took from us that opportunity to fall down on our face and learn how to stand up. Jason Dorsey and Ryan Healy both make a living advising their fellow 20-somethings on how to cope with work. Ryan started a website for that purpose, and Jason has written two how-to books for them. And while he admits his mother picked out his suit for this interview, his generation is not going to make the same mistakes their parents made. We're not going to settle because we saw our parents settle. And we have options that we can keep hopping jobs. No longer is it bad to have four jobs on your resume in a year, whereas for our parents or even Gen X, that was terrible. But that's the new reality for us. And we're going to keep adapting and switching and trying new things until we figure out what it is. And figuring it out takes time. Sociologists tell us most Americans believe adulthood begins at 26 or older and that having witnessed so many sacrifices by their parents to achieve middle-class security has had a huge impact. Family and friends are the new priorities. Blind careerism is beginning to fade. We definitely put lifestyle and friends above work. No mm. question about it. Do you both feel that that's pretty much the way one should look at life? Yeah, I do. Absolutely. I do, yeah. yeah. I remember my dad getting laid off. All these things are going up, and that's because they sacrificed for the company. Well, the first thing action for me is, I sure don't want to do that. I'm going to be in it for me, and I'm going to make it work. Where does this fantasy about, I'm going to find the dream job, there's no such thing as a dream job. I mean, a few of us, like me. <laughs> but where does this fantasy come from? I think we were told when we were little, you can be anything you want. And then they went on and on. And big told lie, us this, right? Big goals are great. Selling a fantasy that everything's going to be perfect and peachy is not. I also think from when you're in your early 20s, and you're really not responsible to a family of kids, this is the time to find the best job, the best career, you know, what you really want to do. And more and more businesses are responding, offering free food, fun, and flexibility to keep their employees happy. Online shoe retailer Zappos.com has found that the best way of keeping employees is giving them what they want. Actual work actually happens despite goofy parades, snoozing in the nap room, and plenty of happy hours. It's a rainy shoes. Hallelujah, it's rainy shoes. Motivational Office consultant Bob Nelson says companies like Zappos will avoid a looming demographic crisis. 
It's harder to get people. There's going to be fewer of them to get. And if you want to keep them and get the best out of them, you sure better know what, what uh, presses their buttons. Nelson, known in the trade as the guru of thank you, believes that the teeniest rewards pay big dividends regardless of age and boss abuse even bigger dividends. I worked with managers that have, if we make this goal, they'll, they'll shave their head type thing, <laughs> or they'll be in the dunk tank at the summer picnic. When a senior manager is willing to do that, it says we're all in it together. All that togetherness comes together every year at the Motivation Show in Chicago. Acre upon acre of coaches, consultants, knickknacks, and fancy stuff. Awards, plaques. You want to say thank you? You'd send them the steaks. People enjoy wine. Rewards for a job well done. Reminders to work harder. You think this would help motivate people to work harder? Oh, it does. Everyone loves plush toys. What a top-hatted lobster has to do with all this is anybody's guess. How about a hallelujah? But for sure, there's an almost evangelical fervor about this work philosophy. No stick, all carrots. And believe it or not, all this prodding, praising, peddling, cajoling, and psychobabble is worth $50 billion a year in business. That's $50 billion. Ain't America great? Where else can you find free back rubs for the deserving worker bee? What's wrong with a happy workplace and taking your time to grow up? Could this be that everything is being delayed and so that adolescence ends at 30, say, right. and middle age starts at 60, say? You can hope that's the case, but while we're having this delayed adolescence, are we getting behind as an economy and as a, as a workforce because we're just all you know, playing computer games at work while we wait to grow up? For all the complaining, Dorsey and Healy believe their generation will transform the office into a much more efficient, flexible, and yes, nicer place to be. Thank you, have a good one. But until then, a message to bosses everywhere, just don't forget the praise. We want to hear it, and truly, we'd love for our parents to know. There's nothing better than mom getting that letter saying, you know, Ryan did a great job. Here, I just wanted to let you know you raised a fantastic son. Send it to grandma too. <laughs>